Yucatan is not an island, nor a point entering the sea, as some thought, but mainland. This land is very hot, and the sun burns fiercely, although there are fresh breezes, like those from the northeast and east. People live long in this country, and men of 140 years have been known. Their social order is founded on the use of nature's resources, and becomes the personality of the local life. Because it is the local life. It renders obeisance to the earth, the waters, and the sky by which the community lives. In these passages from the Relación de las Cosas de Yucatán, the missionary Diego de Landa tells us about an ancient and mysterious Mesoamerican civilization which the Spanish came into contact with at the beginning of the 16th century, when they reached the American continent, the Maya. According to Delanda's account, the Maya civilization was incredibly devoted to nature, and its society was closely linked to it in almost all its aspects. Diego de Landa arrived in Yucatan in 1549 with the task of converting to Christianity the Maya population of that area, which had been recently occupied by the Spanish conquistadors. In his quest, de Landa meticulously observed and documented their religion, their traditions, and their history in a report that has survived to this day. Hence, to Diego de Landa we owe most of what we know today about the Maya. This is quite absurd, given that in order to fulfill his mission, de Landa himself ordered a very severe inquisition with the aim of eliminating all references to the local religion, considered diabolical, which led to the destruction of the majority of Maya books containing their culture. Unfortunately, only four pre-Columbian manuscripts or codices survived this destruction. These, together with Delanda's account and post-colonial Maya records, such as the Popul Vuh, tell us of a great civilization that was able to tame the elements of nature, the same nature which in turn shaped its destiny. We are Fabio and Giulio, and we believe that the most fascinating place to explore is the past. We've always been passionate about history and archaeology, so we have decided to explore it with you. In this series, we want to investigate the most incredible events, eras, and mysteries of history, and tell you why some have changed its course, and others have remained forever in the collective imagination. Welcome back! In this documentary, we want to dive into the Maya world and explore with you their relationship with nature. To do so, my brother Giulio will head to Mexico, and precisely Yucatan. Sky, earth, water, elements that played a key role in the development of this great civilization and its downfall. We want to start our journey with the Maya's fascination with the sky, The Sun, the Moon, Venus. These are among the main celestial bodies that the Maya were keen to observe, and whose journey in the sky was of vital importance for their civilization. According to the Maya, the uninterrupted movement of stars and planets was connected to the world of the divine. Not only the stars were considered the gods themselves, but by interpreting these movements, the Maya believed that they could understand their will. This inevitably influenced earthly actions, the planning of religious rituals, the ascension to the throne of sovereigns, the organization of agriculture, and even wars. Astronomy and religion were completely intertwined. For instance, the sun was believed to be the god Kinigahau, who shone in the sky during the day and turned into a jaguar at night to cross the underworld, the Shibalba. 
being able to precisely foresee equinoxes and eclipses would therefore allow the Maya people to reveal his will. We know that the study of the skies was in fact conducted by priests, whom through advanced maths and the use of writing managed to acquire extremely developed astronomical knowledge, all done without advanced tools such as the telescope, but only based on naked eye observations. I am in Chichen Itza, Yucatan, Mexico. This is one of the most important archaeological sites in the entire world. It is considered one of the seven new wonders of the world. And this place perfectly encapsulates why the Maya were so fascinated with the sky. Behind me, there is a partially ruined building, which can tell us a lot about the level of astronomical knowledge of the Maya. It was nicknamed by the Spanish El Caracol, or Snail, due to the circular staircase that goes to the top. Nowadays, we call it the observatory. And in fact, the dome behind me actually resembles a modern observatory. And despite the fact that the structure actually once was cylindrical, we can infer that the Maya people actually used it for the observation of the sky due to its elevation. This is demonstrated by how the building is carefully oriented to the movement of the Sun and other celestial bodies, in particular Venus. The openings at the top, used as viewing shafts, align perfectly with the extreme points of Venus's path in the sky, a path that follows an eight-year cycle. This is such a peculiar movement that it even confused the ancient Greeks. The fact that the Maya knew that Venus would reappear in the same point in the sky every eight years tells us that El Caracol was in all likelihood also an instrument that measured the passing of time. We know that the Maya dedicated many studies to measure the passing of time and define its units. This gave rise to the Maya calendar. What we commonly call the Maya calendar is the union of three time measurement systems, the Tzolkin, the Hab, and the Long Count. The Maya were not the first Mesoamerican civilization to adopt a calendar. In fact, we find elements of it in more ancient calendars from the Zapotec and the Olmec civilizations, dating back to 500 BCE. According to Maya tradition, it's Amna, creator of the universe, was the one who conferred this knowledge to the Maya. The first system is the Tzolkin, or religious calendar, a cycle of 260 days where each day is represented by a unique combination of the numbers 1 to 13 and of a series of 20 different names. The second system of the Maya calendar is the Hab, or solar calendar, a 365-day cycle that consists of 18 20-day-long months, plus 5 unlucky days at the end of the year, or Wayeb, considered by the Maya to be days of uncertainty and danger. Now, the combination of the Tzolkin and the Hab defines the calendar round, that is, when both cycles are used to define each day, we obtain a longer cycle, where each date repeats itself every 52 years. However, given the cyclical nature of the system, the calendar round does not allow to date past events and establish when they occurred. To do this, the Maya used a third system, the long count, a linear calendar used to count the days from a starting point, the beginning of the present era which, according to the Maya, was August 11th, 3114 BCE. So, by inscribing the five digits of the long count next to a calendar round date on many of their monuments, the Maya were therefore able to record historical events. The presence of a long count calendar is of great historical relevance. As the Maya civilization grew and flourished, events start to get recorded and around the year 250 CE, we start seeing the first appearances of dated monuments, which marks the beginning of the Maya Classic period. 
This era, which lasted until 900 CE, saw the peak of this civilization with the construction of great cities, the birth of legendary kings, and the countless wars that engulfed their kingdoms. In fact, it is important to mention that the Maya never unified under one single empire, but rather many independent city-states and small kingdoms formed over time. These cities would join in political leagues and would strengthen their relationships with strategic marriages, but often rivalry would rise between the major city-states and war would ensue. Maya warfare was brutal and battles were typically quick and chaotic. The objective was to intimidate or weaken the rival kingdoms by inflicting a series of defeats with small-scale surprise attacks in strategic locations, closer to a Cold War rather than a full-scale one. These battles were led by the political elites and even kings would take part in order to gain prestige, adorned with their colorful crowns, jewels, sometimes even skulls hanging at their waists. But war could continue for years, and finish only when decisive, bold actions would finally be taken, like sieges or direct confrontations. The objective was the destruction of the enemy. These high-stake battles are commonly called Star Wars. The term is inspired by the Mayan glyph that was used to refer to them, a symbol representing stars flooding the land with small drops of blood. These final acts were in fact planned with the help of astronomers that would study the sky and determine the most propitious moment to carry out the attacks, based on the movement of Venus, the planet bringer of war. Only with Venus's favor, a war could finally be won. Wars, names, dates were passed down by the Maya to future generations through the use of a set of almost a thousand glyphs, which were part of a very sophisticated logographic writing system. The Maya wrote on ceramics, wood, and especially paper. Thousands of books must have been written throughout the centuries, but the majority of them are now lost, destroyed in the Spanish conquest. But it is through another natural element, fundamental for the Maya, that the stories of distant wars and powerful kings managed to stand the test of time. Stone, which the Maya learned to sculpt with precision and art. Yucatan is in fact a land extremely rich in limestone. 80% of the territory is covered in it. For the Maya, this meant that stone was a very available material that they could find easily and use for many purposes. In almost every Maya archaeological site, we find inscriptions on stone, colorful murals on building walls, glyphs on columns and lintels, and above all, written records of their history, carved on huge flat stones standing on the ground. These are commonly called stelae, and they are some of the most impressive remains of this civilization. In order to see with my own eyes some of the remaining stile, I decided to come here, in Calakmul, one of the two most important settlements in the Maya classical era. Here in this site, 117 stile have been found. As you can see, many of these stile have been eroded in time and they are now illegible. But some others, they still show glyphs and signs that we are able to interpret. They tell us about ancient sovereigns, the dates of their birth or their coronations. So they are an immense source of information about the Maya history. One of the most famous examples is Stile 51, which portrays Yuknum Tuk Kawil, who reigned over Kalakmul from 702 to 736 CE. His name is mentioned on stelae from the same period found in other Maya cities. This provides us with useful information on what were the political alliances in the region. His reign, however, ended at the hand of E. Kin Chan Kawil, the great king of the rival city Tikal, who attacked and defeated Kalakmul in 736 CE. When it comes to the Maya's use of stone, it is perhaps the monumental architecture 
what really amazes anyone who walks among the ruins of ancient Maya cities. Majestic buildings, platforms, temples, all built with extreme ingenuity and very limited access to advanced tools. It is very surprising that the Maya did not use the wheel, nor pack animals or metal tools. Raw materials were dragged on wooden logs or massive boulders, and then worked and carved using chisels that were made out of wood or stone or obsidian. It is quite remarkable that the Maya were able to achieve a level of ability in the use of stone that was not inferior to that of other ancient civilizations that used to have much more modern tools. But when you think about the Maya, there's one type of structure that immediately comes to mind. The pyramids, huge and elaborate buildings that were built with massive stone blocks that were carefully carved and placed in order to give these buildings the iconic stair-step shape. The massive pyramid behind me is the largest structure among the 1,700 found here in Kalakmul, and with its height of 45 meters, is one of the most massive pyramids in the whole Maya world. The Maya pyramids stood above all else in the main settlements of Yucatan. And in fact, more than anything else, they symbolized the power of their cities and the great kings that built them. But the most impressive example of Maya pyramid is here in Chichen Itza. Behind me, there is El Castillo, the single structure that probably earned this archaeological site the name of Wonder of the World. El Castillo stands out among all the other Maya pyramids, especially because of its particularly ingenious design. In fact, there are two stunning characteristics that I want to tell you about. First, the pyramid was built to mimic the sound of the quetzal bird, a sacred animal for the Maya. In proximity to the pyramid, if somebody claps their hands, the sound is going to travel to the top. In the chamber inside that temple, resonate and come back as an echo, reproducing exactly the chirping of the quetzal. Let's try. This pyramid is dedicated to the god Kukulkan, the feathered serpent, which is a god that we find also in other Mesoamerican cultures. For the Aztecs, it was called Quetzalcoatl. And the second effect that I want to talk about is connected to this divinity. In fact, during each equinox at sunset, we can see a shadow that is cast from these steps onto the side of the northern staircase. And this figure goes from the top to the bottom of the pyramid, and together with a stone head, it forms the figure of a serpent. A serpent descending from the sky to the living world, and then the underworld. Pyramids were also the location of religious ceremonies, and sometimes background to chilling sacrificial practices. Human blood was usually offered to the gods as a potent source of nourishment, therefore Bloodletting rituals performed by the elites were essential to please the gods. Diego de Landa himself tells us about this practice. At times, they sacrificed their own blood, cutting all around the ears in strips, which they let hang as a sign. At other times, they perforated their cheeks or the lower lip. Again, they made cuts in parts of the body or pierced their tongue crossways 
and pass talks through it, causing extreme pain. Thanks to the archaeological evidence and references in the codices, we know that the Maya also performed human sacrifice, at least since the classic period and surely when the Spanish arrived. In fact, we know of missionaries of the 17th century sacrificed in religious rites, including Domingo de Vico and Diego Delgado. The reasons for offering a life to the gods could range from the construction of a building to the coronation of a ruler. There were many methods such as heart removal, killing with bow and arrows, or even disembowelment. But the most common by far was the decapitation, represented by the axe event glyph. We know, for example, of the sacrificial decapitation in 736 CE of the king of Copan, captured by the opposing city-state Quirigua. Scholars hypothesized that this type of sacrifice took place at the end of sporting events that had a ritual significance. We are talking about the ball game. These games were played in courts like this one, the Grand Ball Court of Chichen Itza, with its 166 meters of length and 70 of width, and its very long sloping walls. It represents one of the largest structures in the site, and by far the largest court in all Mesoamerica. Interestingly, its walls are not surprisingly decorated with depictions in vast relief of human sacrifices, precisely by decapitation. Ritual sacrifices by decapitation, taking place after the end of a match, were in all likelihood intended to reenact one of the main legends of the Maya myth, the legend of the hero twins and their victory of the gods of the underworld. The ancient legend, described in detail in the Popol Vuh, starts with the tragic death of two brothers, Hunun Hapu and Vukub Hunhapu, who one day, playing the ball game near the entrance of Shibalba, the underworld, disturbed its lords. The lords of Shibalba captured and sacrificed them, and the head of the unfortunate Hunun Hapu was hanged on a tree. One day, the daughter of one of the Shibalba lords was passing by the tree and the head of Hunun Hapu, with its last energies, spat on her hands, conceiving two twins, Unhapu and Ishbalanque. Since a young age, the twins showed great ability in hunting, remarkable intelligence and wit, and supernatural powers. When they learned about the story of their father and uncle, they decided to avenge them. They started playing the ball game near the entrance of Shivalba to disturb its lords. Again, the lords invited them in the underworld in order to kill them. They avoided death multiple times and successfully completed all the challenges thrown at them. Then, they magically changed their aspects and remained in Shivalba undercover, performing magic tricks where they would kill themselves and resuscitate. When rumors of these miracles arrived to the ears of the lords, they asked for the trick to be performed on them. The masterful plan of the twins had arrived to its conclusion. The twins killed the gods but did not revive them. They revealed their identity as the twins Unhapu and Ishbalanque and declared their victory over Shibalba. For the Maya, the Shibalba was not only part of the myth, it was a real place, and it could be accessed through some hidden passages, actual portals to the underworlds, the cenotes, natural pools of sacred water that connected the surface with the realm of the dead, and its water, the third natural element that we want to talk about. The cenotes are natural sinkholes filled with fresh water that are scattered throughout the Yucatan Peninsula. They are often connected by an intricate net of underground rivers and caves. It is widely believed these holes formed in the aftermath of the impact of an asteroid 66 million years ago, the same that caused the extinction of dinosaurs. The territory of Yucatan is not rich in rivers, but its soil is mainly formed of limestone, which allows rainwater to remain trapped between the rocks and accumulate in the cenotes. 
The cenotes therefore represented for the Maya one of the main sources of drinking water, and given their extreme importance, many Maya cities were founded around them. For example, Chichen Itza, which in the Mayan language means at the mouth of the well of the Itza, was founded around two cenotes, one of them being the sacred cenote. Here, the inhabitants of Chichen Itza would perform a ritual sacrifice where a person would be cast into the cenote together with precious objects to please Chak, the god of rain. The Maya became very skilled in managing the water that they had available. They even manipulated the surrounding landscape, creating water basins and vast drainage systems to ensure agriculture would thrive and to give their cities constant access to fresh water. This allowed the main Maya settlements to grow into large cities and the economy to flourish, effectively making the Maya civilization a rich and developed urban civilization. Therefore, it is clear that water, and in particular rain, were essential elements for the Maya. In Chichen Itza, as well as other sites, we can see many elaborate decorations portraying hooked-nosed masks representing the god Chak. We can see Chak's refigurations on El Castillo, on the dome of El Caracol, and on other structures, like the Iglesia, a later addition to the urban landscape of the city, which is believed to be originally an administrative building. Finding so many depictions of the god of rain on these walls makes us think that the use of water, its availability, but also its scarcity, had to be, especially in the last period of the Maya civilization, recurring themes that shaped public life. Recent studies support the theory that around 800-900 CE, the Yucatan Peninsula was hit by a period of intense drought caused by significant reduction in rainfall, which lasted for more than a century. This was particularly felt in the Yucatan Southern Lowlands, where most of the powerful city-states of the Maya Classic period, such as Tikal and Calakmul, were located. As you can imagine, the hostile Yucatan lands made this civilization extremely susceptible to these prolonged droughts. Maize crop yields would have decreased dramatically, and terrible famine would have spread all over the area. In all likelihood, this crisis was also driven by an ecological collapse caused by the use that the Maya made of natural resources. Despite the incredible ingenuity that the Maya demonstrated in using water, which transformed such an inhospitable land into the cradle of a magnificent advanced civilization, large-scale agriculture, centuries of deforestation and slash-and-burn fertilization techniques eroded the already thin layer of soil of the Yucatan lowlands, further fueling the crisis. And imagine what it would feel like to live in a period with such scarce resources. People rose resentful and cities weakened. For many of the city-states, the only way to deal with this crisis was to attack rival cities in order to accumulate lands, resources and workforce. War swept across the Maya world like never before. And often, neighboring kingdoms had to form military alliances in order to face the attacks of the enemy. And it is precisely for this reason that the second part of the classical era was entirely defined by the conflict between the two powers that contended the hegemony over the South Lowlands, Tikal and Kalakmul, which ended up clashing over and over because they grew so much in influence, power and ambition, and ultimately involved the entire region dictating its fate. Tikal and Kalakmul fought in multiple so-called Star Wars between the 6th and the 10th century CE. Throughout the first half of the Classic Era, from the 3rd to the 6th century CE, Tikal was the hegemonic Maya superpower, with extensive military alliances and territorial influence far superior to its rival Kalakmul. However, Kalakmul, city of the Snake Lords, managed to gain the upper hand over Tikal in 546 CE, during a war that involved a great number of other city-states, 
allied to one or the other. After this defeat, Tikal entered a period of steep decline. A second war occurred between 648 and 695 CE, when Tikal managed to temporarily regain control over the region. In 736 CE, the third and last war between the two city-states came to an end, this time with the definitive defeat of Kalakmul. By this point, however, violence had become endemic to the region. Centuries of constant struggles, the exacerbation of climatic conditions, and the inevitable scarcity of resources finally led to the collapse of the society. The end of the classic period was characterized by the complete abandonment of the major Maya centers of southern Yucatan. We know this happened because dates cease to be recorded on stone monuments and large-scale buildings are no longer constructed. What we commonly call the collapse of the Maya civilization wasn't a real collapse, but rather a shift of the center of power of this civilization, probably fueled by the displacement of the population of the southern lowlands into the surrounding territories. In fact, while the southern Yucatan cities were abandoned, further north in the Yucatan Peninsula, new urban centers rose to prominence, and the Maya culture flourished once again, in cities such as Chichen Itza, which became the leading Maya power of the post-classic period. Surprisingly, after a few centuries of hegemony and splendor, Chichen Itza was in turn abandoned, around the year 1200 CE. It is not clear why this occurred, but scholars hypothesized that once again, drought and soil erosion contributed to the fall of the city. And like in a cycle destined to repeat itself, the decline of Chichen Itza gave way to the next Maya superpower, Mayapan. However, none unlike the great Maya cities that preceded it, whose splendor had been forgotten by then, Mayapan too would fall. The city would eventually be abandoned for similar reasons in 1461 CE. And it is precisely in this very period of Maya history that a final threat hit the region like never before. It was carried by water, this time the sea, and it arrived on huge wooden ships, the Spanish conquistadors. The first encounter occurred in 1502, only a few years after the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. For a couple of decades, however, the Spanish did not demonstrate interest in the Maya lands, but rather focused on the conquest of the gold-rich Aztec up north in Mexico. Despite this, the battle for the survival of the Maya began immediately before any actual physical confrontation with the Spanish, due to the arrival from the old world of diseases such as smallpox, flu, and measles, which spread among Maya people like wildfire. The civilization was therefore already on its knees when the Spanish, after the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan had fallen, finally decided to head south and conquer the Maya territories conflict raged for the next 200 years, during which the Maya resisted with great strength against the Spanish conquest. Beyond Maya warfare tactics, ambushes in the jungle, which the Spanish struggled to predict, the key factor that hindered the conquest for so long was the lack of a unified kingdom, unlike the Aztec Empire. However, in the end, diseases and the more advanced resources of the Spanish, including horses, the wheel, firearms proved to be unbeatable, and by 1697 all Maya territories had been integrated into the Spanish Empire. This was the end of independent Maya history. Going back to Diego de Landa, it is during this last terrible chapter that the brutalities of the Spanish Inquisition were carried out seeking to erase centuries of written Maya culture. We found a large number of books and as they contained nothing in which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them much affliction. This was the end of the ancient Maya civilization, but not of the Maya people. The descendants of the ancient Maya still inhabit the lands of Yucatan, Guatemala, and Belize, 
speak Mayan languages and carry those traditions that the land has so much disdained. Now, we have come to the end of our journey, where we uncovered so much of this amazing ancient civilization. In particular, we explored their connection with nature, their fascination with the sky, their use of stone, and their need for water. In the end, it seems that nature took everything back. Huge trees grow where great cities once flourished. And the best metaphor is right here in Calakmuli, a city completely surrounded by the jungle. Streets, plazas, and ruined ball courts, all of them overtaken by the vegetation, by nature. But the great Maya pyramids, they still soar high over the jungle canopy.